Okay, thank you. Um, so can you all hear me okay, hopefully? Right, so I'm gonna talk uh, this afternoon a little bit about what we've been doing at Rothamsted Research to implement fair data principles for our long-term agricultural experiments. So long-term experiments started um, at Rothamsted, uh, were started in between 1843 and 1856 by Laws and Gilbert. And today we've got around 10 existing long-term experiments. There's been about 50 altogether over the history of the, the site. And these experiments really examine multiple different factors. So the two experiments you can see here are Broadbalk, which is our oldest, and the large-scale rotation at Brooms Barn, which is our newest experiment. And both experiments examine a range of different treatment factors, and these include crop rotation systems, crop management systems, uh, crop protection and fertilization. And this is, this is quite common for long-term experiments globally, this, this range of factors. But what really adds to the complexity of these experiments is time. So when we start an experiment, the, the experiment you're running 20, 30, 40 years later isn't the same thing that you started off with to keep relevant, the, these experiments have to change. Um, so that could be changes to the treatments, it could be changes to the cropping, uh, it could be changes to the management. And it's crucial that these changes are understood and, and documented because if you don't understand those changes, then it, it's harder to understand how you should be analyzing your, your data. Um, this fear of misrepresentation of data is something that's, that's traditionally held us back a bit from making the data available. But in our case, the, the data, or well, some of the data is, is available. So in two, 2013, we launched uh, the, what we call the ERA platform. And this makes a lot of the background information for the experiments uh, available. And we also have some of the data, annual plot level data available as a um, on a request-based system. And there's also aggregated data sets which are, are freely available. So we have a lot of content, but the content as it's currently presented is, is often in semi-structured narratives and is inconsistent across experiments and is in a range of different formats too. So some of it's in HTML, some of it's as PDFs, and uh, others is as Excel. And the site itself is it's coming up to eight years old and is in a bit of a need for a refresh. As for the data, uh, the data sets, well, some of the data sets are accessible and they do have conditions of access attached to them. So we say how you can use these data sets, but they're not really fair. So there's no, very often there's no persistent identifier attached to them. So there's no DOI. The metadata isn't presented in context with the data sets. So it's not, not easy to interpret and understand those data sets. And there's no appropriate annotation, semantic annotation of the data and field. So there's a, there's a barrier there to how you can use these data sets interop for interoperability. And we even have data sets where, in a, particularly in Excel, where the, the data is mixed with explanatory text. And this is clearly not a, a good practice. So what are we doing to address this situation, try and make our data from these experiments fairer? Well, I was, I was hoping to have a new website up and running by now, but uh, thanks to COVID, it's been delayed a bit. But hopefully you can see from a couple of screenshots here that we've, we're going for a, a somewhat cleaner design. Um, but what we've done is we've refactored how we display a lot of this information. So we're using the Global Long-Term Agricultural Experiment Network metadata schema to, to really describe in a more consistent way the experiment. So this schema allows us to describe and characterize each experiment in terms of its purpose, so why this experiment was set up, uh, what the, the measurements are that we're taking from it. We can characterize the environment for the date for the experiment, so we can provide information about its soil. We can provide information about the climate. And we can provide uh, information about the experimental design. So what are the treatment factors? And more importantly, we can describe how these things have changed over time. And so the GL10 schema that we're using maps onto the, 
data science schema. Um, so data science schema is, is the schema that backs up uh, DOIs. And this is a very powerful tool for us because it allows us to really express and assert the relationships between the experiments and the different data sets and resources that make up that experiment. So in this example here, we can see for Broad Bork, which is our longest running experiment, we have the experiment is, is split into three main periods. And so there's a wheat yield data set corresponding to each of those periods. And so for our most recent period, the modern period, there are additional data sets um, from this experiment. So we have one for soils, we have one for weeds, and we have one for uh, grain quality. And using this schema, we can, we can define the relationships between these different resources. And we can even define relationships to data sets from other experiments. So we can see that there's a, a relationship to a wheat yield data set from our alternate wheat and fallow experiment. So for the data sets themselves, we are moving to publishing data sets using um, DOIs and we, we're really trying to exploit uh, to the full extent the data science schema here to, to provide a very rich description of the data set. So using this, uh, so when we publish a, a data set, uh, it has a, the DOI resolves to a landing page on our new site and using the schema we can provide very detailed information about the methods, the provenance and the quality of that data set. We can provide information on the access conditions and the licensing for that data set, how it can be cited, the temporal and spatial coverage. We can recognize the contributor to that data set and the funding for that data set. And as we've seen, we can also identify the related resources for that data set. The metadata from this, this data site schema can also be harvested into our own institute repository. So we use a, a Haplo repository uh, for the Institute, and this is open air validated. Um, and so we have that further reassurance that the quality and the conformance on the quality and the conformance of the metadata that we're providing. So within the, the actual data sets, we've adopted a, a data package approach for structuring them. So every data that we data set that we produce use is really a set of different files. And in most cases, our data sets follow a standard star schema uh, structure. So we have an annual plot level data table. So this is a CSV file containing the observed and measured data for each plot year in the data set. And then there's various dimension tables which sit around this. And these, these tables provide descriptive data for the fields in the data table. Each data set also has a readme uh, so this, the README provides a file manifest, so it tells you what's in that. And it also provides a few other basic descriptive properties for the data set. Finally, there's a field to metadata CSV, and this is essentially the data dictionary for all the tables, in, all, all the data tables in the data set. And with this approach, um, it's, we found this approach is very easy for our data curators to maintain its something that's understandable by the curators, they can easily maintain and document the data sets as they're produced. But we can also use this to very quickly and easily convert these collections of CSV files into a, a machine readable data package. So we've been playing around with tools like frictionless data and research object crates uh, to, to create machine readable data packages. And those data packages can then be consumed uh, programmatically using uh, tools like R and Python and combined with other data sets that are provided in a similar structure. So in a bit more detail then, this is the uh, Broadbalk Soils data set. And so we're providing here annual plot level data. And you can see that the data has a structure to it. Um, so in the blue columns, you have the observed and the measured data for our data set. The green uh, columns are the positional fields for identifying the plots in time and space. And the yellow columns are identifying the different treatment factors which have been applied to these plots. And this structure is repeated across 
data sets. And this is an important consideration as it means users of our data sets can expect, a, a, know what to expect every time they open a data set. So there's a consistency to the way that our data sets are structured. And this further allows users to, to more easily uh, link together and use the data sets. So this is an example of one of the dimension tables for this data set. So this, this table uh, describes all the different treatments which have been used uh, in this experiment. Uh, but the main thing to draw your attention to here is for two of the columns, uh, we have an RDF type, and this is where we start to provide semantic annotation for the data. So these are annotations for the, the column or to the left. And this is really how we're starting to build in more interoperability, semantic interoperability to the data sets. And finally, this is an example of um, the, the metadata, uh, the fields metadata for the, this data set, so the, the data dictionary, if you like. And so there's a lot of uh, standard bits of information here that you'd expect to see from a data dictionary. So you have the field name, uh, more descriptive title, the data type, uh, the formatting and measurement units, if applicable, how to handle missing values, and any constraints on the data. But again, we also have this RDF type for the semantic annotation of these fields. Um, the approach we've taken is for fairly generic uh, concepts within our database is to use um, schema.org, so for things like dates or names. Uh, but if we have a more specialist um, concept that we want to define, say like herbicide application, then we would look to a, a more relevant community ontology. So things like PICO, uh, agronomy ontology and Agrivoc. And using this structure, we can very easily, as I mentioned, can convert this into a machine readable format. So in this case, this is a, a JSON uh, description using the frictionless data format. So in terms of measuring up, I think we've we've done a pretty good job so far of um, converting from you know, a, a very old fashioned way of presenting data into a much fairer way. But there's still a, a few things to do. And one of the next steps for us is to really quantify um, using fair metrics and, and to provide a, a proper measure for how we're doing and use that to try and fill in some of the gaps and keep on improving. So a couple of uh, lessons and observations I think we've taken from this is, well, first of all, you can't change the culture overnight. So our, we've had to bring our researchers along um, to be comfortable with the data that's being released. And this data set mindset is still very prevalent uh, within our, our community. And it, it has clear advantages. We can publish a data set and it can be measured um, and researchers who are publishing those data sets have, have some confidence in how that's going to be used. When you start talking about uh, things like open link data, um, that really deconstructs the idea of a data set. And a lot of our researchers are not really comfortable with that idea yet because it's, it's their data and they, they don't really understand how it's been combined with other data sets and how that's affecting you know, things like the provenance and how they can measure and report on that for funding. Crucially, we had a, a bit of a skills gap when we started this, and that's something that we have to address. Um, so you've got to invest in your, in your staff and train your data managers uh, who really understand the data. And all the way through this, you've got to keep developing best practices and using best practices. And we try and take those from the community as much as possible, um, but you've got to use what works for your team. And finally, you need to be sensitive to your audience and what their skills are. I think this touches on Andy Jarvis's keynote yesterday about inclusivity. So you know, while we have researchers who can start to use APIs and write Python code and R code to use those sorts of data structures, um, I've yet to meet any researcher who can write a Sparkle query, for example, and most of our researchers are still very much in this data set uh, mindset. And so we, we need to keep providing uh, data sets in a format uh, that they can use, but also start steering them, I think, to that, that more linked 
world that we, we all dream of. So I was hoping to talk a little bit more about a project that we had going with um, the University of Sequoia to talk about this capacity development, but unfortunately the COVID-19 has, has delayed that a bit. So I'm gonna quickly finish off with um, a bit of work we're doing to use knowledge graphs to describe some of the complexity of our experiments. Um, so very quickly, uh, we, this is a woven layarable experiment. It's a complex experiment which uses um, many different rotations as treatments. And what we have been trying to do is model this as a way of uh, providing a deeper understanding for our end users. So we have 17 crops and 14 rotations and you put them together and you get this. So we're, we're quite excited about using this um, way of, of describing this data model for describing the, the experiments data as a way of supporting researchers to dive deeper into some of these more complex experiments to, to identify uh, the data thereafter. So I will finish there and uh, thank you to, to my colleagues and thank you to IGAD for the opportunity to present.